Michael Keaton really seems to enjoy being associated with flying animals, huh? First Batman, then Birdman, and now Vulture, and I guess Batman again? I wonder if his next big role is going to be Big Bird. Now that'd be a movie that I'd pay to see. You know the drill. Click away if you haven't seen Spider-Man Homecoming. Remember before Captain America Civil War when we didn't even know if Spider-Man was even going to be in the MCU ever? Yeah, well, now look at Marvel. They've made five films with this character. And just look at the box office and critical reception. Civil War, Homecoming, Infinity War, Endgame, Far From Home. There was a time when Amy Pascal, head of Sony, thought that this would be a bad idea. Well, now? Probably not so much. So, after Civil War, fans were super excited for the next Spider-Man film, but still, even I had to be cautiously optimistic. Sony has a track record of introducing Spider-Man in a film, and then butchering it at some point, whether it be Spider-Man 3 or The Amazing Spider-Man 2. And in fairness, though I loved every second of it, we only had like 5 minutes of Peter Parker and maybe another 10 of Spider-Man in Civil War. Though it was absolutely amazing, none of us knew that if this Tom Holland kid could actually carry his own film. Well, I think we got our answer pretty quickly. First of all, can I say, Sony, I'm talking to you and your marketing team, your marketing for these Spider-Man films is absolutely terrible. I don't know exactly what's wrong, and maybe you've learned your lesson now because the Morbius trailer was absolutely incredible and I loved every second of it. And the Spider-Man Far From Home trailers were pretty good, although Marvel probably mandated a ton of things from these trailers seeing as they were coming out after Endgame, but still. However, the second or third trailer for this film literally spoiled almost everything from the second act. Why would you do that? Seriously, what in the world do you think you need to sell this movie for? It's Spider-Man. Just show us some cool action and don't really reveal the story. Don't just spoil the entire New York Ferry sequence with Iron Man literally showing up and saving the day. Come on, that would have been so much better to see on the big screen. And then on top of that, like a week before the film came out, they released the entire first five minutes of the movie, the little homemade footage that Peter makes. Again, guys, what's wrong? You just ruined like half your movie before it even came out and you literally did the exact same thing with The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Please don't do this again. You did well with Far From Home and I hope this doesn't happen again with Spider-Man 3. No, not that one. Anyways, all that aside, let's talk about the actual movie because though I knew a lot more than I would have liked to heading into it, it still didn't have too significant of an impact on my viewing experience anyways. And as we all know, they did save the biggest twist for the film, and thank goodness they did. But we'll get to that later. So the film opens and we see the introduction of Adrian Toomes as he's dealing with the aftermath and cleanup of the Battle of New York before he and his crew get kicked out by Tony Stark and damage control. Okay, first of all, that's just brilliant. Like, what an absolutely seamless, yet ingenious and clever way to set up a villain. Yeah, remember that segment, Bash the MCU Villain? Get that out of here. Because Vulture, maybe next to Thanos, is one of the best MCU villains, and it's not even close. Not even remotely. I mean, first of all, aside from the whole twist and everything, Adrian Toomes is such a complicated character. He has one moment where he becomes a little over-the-top villainous, where he picks up this disintegration gun and blasts the Shocker 1. But even then, he's like, oh, I thought it was something else, like an anti-gravity gun. If you watch this film carefully and closely, every action, every word, it's deliberate, it's carefully thought out. And he acts like a real person with real stakes and motivations. He's doing what he can to protect his family, and that's seriously such a good motivation for a villain. Because the best villains believe that what they're doing is right, and Toomes clearly wants to protect his family at all costs, which causes him to go a little farther than what we think is acceptable. But think about it. Almost everyone would go to a great length to protect their family, especially parents like Adrian Toomes. Right away we're able to connect to the character and relate to him because he does what he does because of real human care. And that connects us to him immediately. There's no maniacal laugh, there's no blasting everything into oblivion. He's just a guy trying to look out for the people he cares about. When I saw one of the Spider-Man Homecoming trailers for the first time, and when Toomes says, I'll kill you and everyone you love, I kinda cringed and was like, oh no, it's another one of those over-the-top MCU villains. Here we go again. But in the context of the scene, that line somehow works. Because after he figures out who Peter is, he's not threatening Peter for the sake of it. He's doing whatever he can to make sure Peter stays away from him and his family. And yeah, let's talk about that twist. Aside from Infinity War and Endgame with their various twists and turns, I'm looking at you, Fat Thor, I think this is the single best twist that Marvel has ever pulled off. Because seriously, I don't think anyone saw that coming. 
At that point in the film, Peter had kind of just given up on being Spider-Man and he was beginning to assert himself as Peter Parker again, getting ready for Homecoming with Liz. And then, boom, the door opens and the entire audience reels and gasps as Vulture walks through the door. The first thought that went through my mind when I saw this film was, oh geez, Toomes kidnapped Peter's date. And then he utters the words, I'm Liz's dad, and my jaw just about dropped to the floor. And then everything clicked. The constant phone calls with his wife and family that they reference, the comments that the Shocker 2 makes when they enter the school, something like, can you imagine what the boss would say if he knew where we were? Everything lined up and just snapped together. I mentioned this before in the Iron Man 3 review, and I'll say it again here. The way you pull off an effective twist or pulling out the rug from under the audience is by giving them something so wholly unexpected that is better than the alternative. I maintain while the Trevor Slattery twist in itself isn't bad, it's not better than the alternative of having a truly frightening and deadly villain in the Mandarin, which is what undermines that twist to me. But this? Oh, you better believe that this is miles ahead of whatever else the final act of Spider-Man Homecoming would have been. Because now there are real, tangible stakes, not just for Tombs or Peter, but now for the both of them, as they struggle to protect Liz and the rest of their families and friends from their secrets. I applaud John Watts so much for this. You guys know how much I love a good villain, and Vulture makes this movie just infinitely better. And the character of Peter Parker in Spider-Man was also absolutely perfect. First of all, Tom Holland is the best Spider-Man and the best Peter Parker, and to me at least, it's not even remotely close. As someone who remembers high school pretty clearly, seeing Homecoming's depiction of what school was like made me so happy. Because other films just depict generic bullies and lockers, cafeteria trays, and all of that. But the high school that Peter went to, with the cringy morning announcements, was so brilliantly captured, and it really, really did remind me of a 21st century high school. On top of that, Peter Parker actually felt like a kid. I respect Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield's performance for different reasons, but come on. Even if you think that they're better than Tom Holland, you can't deny. They do not look like high schoolers. And while 15 may be a little young, because in the film, Tom Holland kind of looks more like 17 or 18, I still bought it. That's one of the most important parts of a Spider-Man film. You have to buy into it. The whole thing about Peter being a smaller hero and having to stick up for his neighborhood, and he does have a literal save the cat moment after the bank robbery, that's what makes you care about the character. And his relationships with other characters like Ned, Liz, Aunt May, they're also real and human. This is a real kid with real friends and a real aunt who loves him. Although I will say, in this film at least, the character of MJ or Michelle or whatever she is in this movie, it's a little strange. I didn't really like her as much and found her kind of distracting if that made sense. Like her performance was intentionally weird, but it just didn't click with me. Until Far From Home. I loved her in that movie. While we're here though, let's get the negatives out of the way. I only really have one other negative, and honestly it's not even that big of a deal, but I will mention this. While Civil War and The Winter Soldier pride themselves with being super complex, deep films with plots that are tangled literally in a spider's web, this film is pretty straightforward and simple, and in some places, pretty cliche. And honestly, I like that about this movie, because it really didn't have to be Inception or the next Memento, and it knew that. But all I will mention is that this film is pretty simple at its core. It's a story about a kid, and honestly, that's perfectly fine. But I did want to mention it, though. And that's it for negatives. Seriously, I mean, sure, do I have nitpicks with the film here and there? Of course. But you have those with every movie. Like, did Aunt May not question at all how Peter Parker was in the same room as Ned, even though she never saw him come in through the door? I guess she was just sort of negligent? In all likelihood, it was just a small oversight by the continuity team at Marvel, but still. But yeah, while no movie is without its faults, I struggle every time I see this movie to find many with this film. I love and adore this iteration of Spider-Man, and I think it's hands down the best live-action Spider-Man film. But you can feel free to tell me that I'm wrong about that in the comments. I'd love to discuss that with you guys. So let's get back to the good of this film, because there's plenty more to talk about. First of all, Tony Stark's role in the movie. While this wasn't necessarily my favorite thing, I actually really enjoyed him in the limited role. Was the Iron Spider at the end a little forced? Yeah, I think it might have worked better as a little post-credits tag, where Tony's standing in a room and he opens the capsule and it shows him the Iron Spider suit, and he just goes, can't believe he turned it down. And Friday goes, should we scrap it for parts? And he goes, could be useful for later, so let's keep it. Because the thing is, the point of this movie was about Peter becoming an Avenger, not becoming the Iron Spider. So at the end of the film, if Tony had just said, you're an Avenger, and then Peter turned it down, I think that'd be much better. Still, Tony's talking to Peter after the ferry incident. I love that scene so much. It's so emotionally resonant because you can just tell how much it hurts Peter. 
Is Tony a little bit too much of a dad? Yeah, probably, but it doesn't bother me that much. If you're nothing without this suit, then you shouldn't have it. That's an amazing line. And then later, when Peter's wearing the homemade suit trapped under the rubble, Tom Holland gets to really flex his acting chops because I thought he played that scene beautifully. He's a 15-year-old kid, and though he's a superhero, when he starts crying and calling out for help, you remember that he's a kid, something that all the other Spider-Man films failed to capture. He's crying out for help because he's not ready to be on his own yet. Not only does he act superbly as Peter Parker, but he does the action and physicality of Spider-Man perfectly. This guy does most of his stunts, and it's just incredible to see him flipping around. Sure, we don't get that iconic swinging through New York shot, which comes in Far From Home, but still. Getting to show off his powers, it was great. And while some complain that, well, he's just too reliant on Tony Stark and this and that, I get that, but I also think the point was to accentuate the fact that when he goes back to the homemade suit, after he got his suit taken away, at the end of the film, he's still Spider-Man. The action in this movie is also excellently done. Would it have been nice to not know the whole fairy thing before seeing this movie? Yeah, probably. But still, the way that Peter messes everything up, and then Iron Man has to swoop in and save the day, that was excellent. The ending Vulture fight on the plane, I'll admit, is a little generic and kind of hard to see. I much preferred the ending of Far From Home, if I'm being honest, but still, it was good. What a lot of people don't really talk about when talking about this film is the humor. This film is absolutely hilarious. While Guardians may have had a higher sheer volume of jokes, I think this film's humor fits better with me. Humor is subjective, and I'm sure many prefer the more slapstick, absurdist humor from the Guardians films, but me personally, I absolutely love the more natural, comedically timed jokes in this film. I mean, the scene at the end with Ned, and you know the one I'm talking about, that cracks me up every single time. And by the way, Ned, who's played by Jacob Batalon, is a national treasure. I just like to interject that here and point that out right now. Anyways. Little jokes like, Peter, nobody wants that, or hey, welcome back, Peter, or even just the awkward tension that's in the room when Peter is picking up Liz, it's brilliantly done. And to top that all off, not only is this film funny, but it deals with the more serious, heartwarming aspects perfectly as well. His romance with Liz is perfectly awkward and flirty and funny and endearing, and it just makes you root for them from the get-go. His relationship with Aunt May, his desire to want to live up to Tony, they're all just so beautifully woven together. In the end, while I'm not sure that a perfect film exists, out of all the MCU films, I think this is the one where I have the least to complain about. Seriously, there's hardly anything. Start to finish. This film is just pure, honest, and endearing. And maybe it doesn't have the super upside that Endgame or Infinity War has, but that's fine, honestly. It doesn't need to. Because in the end, this is a story of a teenage boy trying to grow up and learn to fill in the shoes that his mentor would leave him to fill as we move past Endgame. And also, the vulture's amazing. Did I mention that? I'm going to give Spider-Man Homecoming an A+, a 9.8 out of 10. Please, no! 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 What did you guys think of Spider-Man Homecoming? Let me know in the comments down below. If you haven't subscribed already, please make sure to do that, support the channel, and give this video a like. If you'd like to check out some more content, check out the videos on the screen right now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.